Welcome to Radio Free Sunroof. This is Colibri's weekly column. <laughs> Slaughter of the Innocents. COVID-19 and the Future of Agriculture. May 6th, 2020. It's early days yet, but the COVID-19 pandemic has already proven to be revelatory, exposing much that is ugly about the normal functioning of the U.S. The sorry state of health care, the unresponsiveness of corporate-owned government, the hyper-individuality of the populace, the high levels of ignorance among the same, and the racism of the entire system. Regarding that lattermost point, this nation was founded by white Europeans who stole the land from the indigenous and then built wealth with African slaves. And guess who's doing the worst in this pandemic? The Native Americans and the Blacks. Look who's protesting the loudest to get things, quote, back to normal. Whites, many of them with Confederate flags. Let that sink in. Agriculture was at the heart of settler colonialism in North America. The land was seized for farming, and the people were kidnapped to work the fields. From these brutal beginnings, the situation has only worsened, especially in the last few decades. Small-scale family farming, a la Old MacDonald, is the stuff of myth at this point, with precious few exceptions. Pesticide use is up, groundwater levels are down, topsoil is blowing away, wildlife diversity is shrinking, and human workers are routinely abused. Corporate ownership of the means of food production has led to concentrated ownership, delocalization, and supply chains that are brittle in response to stress. A handful of corporate giants, in fact only four, have gobbled up most of the meat industry. These corporations have set up economies of scale that utilize mass mechanization and impose horrific living conditions never before seen, and not seen enough thanks in part to ag-gag laws that forbid photographic or video documentation of what goes on in such places. One could be forgiven for assuming these companies don't want their customers to know the details of how their meat is processed, especially when the results are things like fecal matter in 100% of the ground beef as found in a food safety test conducted by Consumer Reports in 2015. Jim Hightower went so far as to say that factory farms aren't even farms, but, quote, concentration camps for animals. A tremendous number of animals are slaughtered in the U.S. each year on average. Over 35 million cows, 123 million pigs, 226 million turkeys, and nearly 8 billion, that's billion with a B, chickens. Shockingly, about 30% of this goes to waste. That stat bears repeating. Nearly one-third of the meat produced every year in the U.S. is thrown away. It's so bad that even the industry cheerleader, Beef Magazine, has felt the need to call attention to the issue. All of this cruelty and waste has been normal up until now. But it just got worse with the COVID-19 pandemic. The latest heinous act has been the depopulating of farm animals, a rather colorless euphemism for killing them and disposing of the bodies without processing them for food. Nearly two million chickens were, quote, destroyed in Delaware because with 50% of the human workforce out due to the pandemic, there weren't enough people to, quote, harvest and process them, and the birds were going to outgrow their facility. According to the Huffington Post, an Iowa farmer gave his pigs injections so they would abort their fetuses, about 7,500 piglets total, due to a lack of space for them. Adult pigs he planned to send away for slaughter were no longer wanted by the processor. The same article mentioned that in Minnesota, 61,000 egg-laying chickens were euthanized because the market for their eggs dried up. The New York Times reports that a single chicken processor is smashing 750,000 unhatched eggs every week. And the New York Daily News states that, quote, about 700,000 hogs are being killed every week across the nation because barns are overcrowded, many plants are either closed or short-staffed, and not enough animals can be processed for meat. What all of these incidents have in common is that they result from a system that, like a moving assembly line, only functions smoothly if every single step is operating consistently. There is little to no margin for error. Unlike an assembly line for manufactured goods, breakdowns on this one result not merely in a misplaced part or a delay, but in pointless death. Doubtless, these are not the only incidents either. 
Farmers are hesitant to publicize such things because they look bad, especially when so many citizens are lining up at food banks. Meanwhile, such incidents will also be repeated, both sooner and later, as the current pandemic undergoes waves and as other disruptions strike civilization, which is inevitable in a world marked increasingly by chaos. The COVID-19 crisis is an opportunity to dispense with what's, quote, normal, Given that normal is generally unhealthy for people and unsustainable for the planet, fundamental change is absolutely necessary. This has been true the whole time, but given the system's immense scale and seemingly unstoppable inertia, it seemed impossible to even start. But now, with the current suspension of the status quo, we have a real opportunity. We should not squander it. Here's what needs to change about farming in general, not just animal agriculture, in the interest of being kinder to the planet and providing a healthier diet for humans. 1. Demonetization. Farmers should be well compensated for their labor, but they should not depend on the vagaries of the market or the crony-controlled policies of the corporate state. We must disconnect food production from the profit motive. 2. Decorporatization. This would perhaps naturally follow demonetization, but we need to make it explicit anyway. The food supply should be in the hands of people, not faceless business entities. 3. Demechanization. The severing of food growing from human hands has been a disaster. Contamination and disease have accompanied mechanization, as has a decline in the quality and flavors of foods, both plant and animal, as they are bred primarily for processing. Using fewer machines means we'll need more humans, but the joys of working outdoors, closer to nature, in the fresh air, would appeal to many if they were given the option. 4. Relocalization The distance from farm to fork must be reduced as much as possible. True, not every region of the country can raise every kind of food for simple reasons of climate. So Florida and California will always need to trade citrus to New England and the Pacific Northwest for apples. But the days of Fuji's from New Zealand and the 1,500-mile salad have to come to an end. 5. Reseasonalization. This would largely be a consequence of relocalization, and what it means is that all food will not be available year-round anymore. Fresh tomatoes, sweet corn, and watermelons will be a summer treat. The colder months will be a time for winter squash, roots, and hardy greens. Rather than considering this arrangement a hardship, it can be the start of a new, re-engaged, place-based consciousness. Our unhappy rootlessness as a culture is exacerbated by our disconnection from the cycles of the seasons where we live. Once we rediscover the rich scrumptiousness of vine-ripened heirloom tomatoes warm from the sun, we won't want the pale, firm, mealy abominations they peddle in January. This appeal of the authentic eventually dulls the appetite for the fake, and applying that to living at large, not just to our diets, will be beneficial to us not only as individuals, but as a society. 6. Renaturalization it's time to drop the chemical inputs, the genetic modification, and the monocropping. Our practices must return to regenerative methods that work with natural processes instead of against them. We've knocked things so far out of balance that the road back to health will be challenging, so the sooner we get to it, the better. Ultimately, this path leads to rewilding and to pre-agricultural wild-tending practices, but that's a whole nother subject. The callous killing of animals, the wholesale wastage of food, the elevation of profits over sustenance and ethics, these things must stop. We must stop them. Making demands of our institutions is part of that, but so is building alternative systems to replace them. We have a real opportunity to create a new society based on real community and actual sustainability through mutual aid. And we cannot remain human-centered. We must view the heartless killing of animals in its true context. As an injury to one, that is an injury to all. If you enjoyed this reading today, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. To find out about the other podcasting I do, visit radiofreesunroot.com.